Welcome to DSG's uh, webinar this evening, Protocol Procedure and Patient Acceptance with Implant Ventures. It's being presented by our very own Dennis Urban, CDT, and VP of Education and Training here at Dental Services Group. It is my pleasure to share a little bit about Dennis this evening, because he brings 40 years of dental technology field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, and quality assurance. A seasoned dental lab manager by day, Dennis also balances being an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Dennis. Well, thank you, Jessica. I appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a, an information-packed webinar here on protocol, procedure, and patient acceptance with implant dentures. Um, I'm going to try to cover as much as I can in one hour. Um, it's impossible to cover every single attachment system or every bar system uh, and all the information uh, that's out there in one webinar, but we're going to have some good, good, uh, good content here tonight. So, uh, and it's called Protocol, Procedure, and Patient Acceptance with Implant Dentures. So we'll go over um, milled bar design and um, we'll talk about the science and the technique and application. Little bar design, implant dentures directly over an implant, a bumping, types of attachment systems with mill, mill bar designs also. Hybrid design protocol and procedure, including chair side conversions on new and existing dentures. And then first of after the after we get through these photos here, we're going to start with uh, implant over dentures. So uh, but first I'd like to stress, you know, the correct materials and techniques are very important to, uh, to utilize on, in, on these types of dentures. So you want to skimp on anything, uh, you know, and it's a reflection of your talents. And, uh, you know, so we're, we're growing in implant technology worldwide, uh, especially implant denture technology. So where are we going to be in, where are we going to be in implant te denture technology, uh, you know, in years to come? So, but I wanted to mention majority of the United States dental laboratories surveyed claim that they had a dramatic increase in implant denture cases in the last five years. So this is a good sign. And overall on the removable side, there's been a big increase in removables in, uh, in the last five years also. Um, and dentists who would like to increase their implant dentures due to a, a, the latest survey in, in uh, Dental Products Magazine was um, 70%. So uh, that's pretty good, you know, 70%. And uh, there's more income op opportunities with laboratories, technicians, dentists, dental manufacturers. And I'd like to mention that, you know, uh, lately, when I, I go on a website or go to a, a dental convention, even the virtual convention that I've been, been on, uh, says so much about implant uh, dentures out there. And, uh, you know, years ago, we didn't hear as much on, on implant dentures and removable technology. And now we have it out there. And there's so many opportunities to capture that, that income and help patients lead a better life with these types of dentures. But it all starts with communication. We want to make sure we, we communicate correctly. Uh, with the dental office and clinician, the oral surgeon, and planning these types of cases. So we depend on the dentist, the surgeon, and periodontist on clinical knowledge and training, the assessment of the patient, the appropriate treatment planning, detailed information on the RX to us at the laboratory. This is important. And of course, digital photography and the quality correct materials to use on these, uh, these types of cases. And the communication from us, the certified dental technicians in the laboratory, depend on our technical expertise, our knowledge and procedures and materials, and case planning, you know, we get together with in place case planning with not only the, the surgeon and the clinician, and periodontist, and, and even the implant company to, to, uh, to make a successful case. We give you the appropriate feedback on impressions, bites, and shades, etc. And uh, digital photography is a must here. Sometimes we'll even get little video clips on, on how the patient uh, goes into excursions with different types of occlusal schemes also. So important, very important on the communication and case planning aspect of it. So implant dentures, we're going to talk about, uh, you know, over dentures first. And, uh, you know, there are a number of advantages that over dentures have over complete dentures. You know, many clinicians believe that complete dentures are not an appropriate restoration and inst instead believe the minimum standard of care should be the two implants on, on a lower denture or an over denture. With many implant and attachment systems on the market, the cost of an implant over denture has become very affordable. So wherever we have natural teeth, roots, or implants, we tend to retain the bone in those areas. Now, this is the one of the most important benefits of overdentures when compared to complete dentures. You know, and patients who are restored with overdentures chew more effectively and have more comfort. And for patients, it raises their confidence level and self-esteem knowing they'll be able to eat most foods and have a stable denture and then have to use denture adhesive. 
So let's talk about a little bit more about uh, implant overtensions. I'd like to put this quote up here from Dr. Massad, Dr. Strong. The removable implant overtension has become a well-established option, if not the most preferred for the utensilist patient. Critical to the success of this procedure is not only an accurate impression of the implant abutments, but also extremely vital is the detail of the entire edentulous ridge and the peripheral borders to maintain stability, retention, and deflect unwanted food and trapping around denture margins. So this is really important when you're making an overtensure. And we'll talk about some comparisons uh, about case planning uh, overtensures compared to uh, a, type, a hybrid type case in a little while. But we're going to get into some of the uh, studies here, and then we'll get into the meat and potatoes in a little while on the overtensures and, and, uh, and hybrid cases. But over 20 million Americans are edentulists, and you know, undergraduate programs across the country now realizing that two implants for lower overdentures are the recommended treatment choice over leaving so many fully edentulists. And the amount of bone loss that dentistry has seen in fully edentulous patients during the past generations is frightening to consider. There's been a lot of atrophy out there. And dentistry taught that bone atrophy was, was normal years ago. We know now that two implants on the anterior mandible will stop this progressive bone loss and prevent and preserve the ridge. So some of the purposes of overdentures are to create natural aesthetics. We want to enhance facial appearance, uh, compensate for the lost soft tissue and enhance function with the right occlusal scheme. Whether it be a lingualized occlusion or centric occlusion, physiological centric occlusion, I like to use, uh, we'll talk about a little bit about it later, you know, lingualized occlusion with these types of cases. And most patients can afford one type of implant over denture since they're less expensive than a fixed prosthesis. So, indications for over dentures. Uh, we mentioned before compromise support for a conventional denture. We talked, you know, we talk about sore spots and not fitting correctly. Overtensions uh, uh, are, are the solution for that. Uh, the patient has poor neuromuscular coordination, a low tolerance on a mucosal tissue with a an acrylic base, maybe an allergic reaction, or maybe too many sore spots, especially on the lower. You know, more more, more desire for stability and comfort. You know, or congenital or oral defects that need oral rehabilitation. So. Let's talk about the three different types of implant dentures out there. Mainly, mainly tissue supported uh, overdentures or two prefabricated individual attachments uh, are utilized and the overdenture is mainly tissue borne. And this is pretty much what we talked about when I showed that quote from Dr. Massad earlier, he was talking about. Then we have our tissue implant supported overdenture. It's more implant borne compared to the previous type. And two implants and a resilient bar, a resilient bar uh, attachment assembly should be utilized. And then we have a fully implant supported overdenture. It's an attachment assembly that usually contains four to six, maybe even more implants. And the attachment assembly transfers all those masticatory forces to the supporting implants. And minimal flange and tissue coverage is required. So we'll cover these different types of uh, overdentures in a little while. So what are the deciding treatment factors? Again, we've talked about the soreness of the, uh, the uh, patient's uh, tissue with the denture base. We want to make sure there's enough bone quantity. That's a deciding factor, factor also. The patient's expectations for the treatment outcome. I always stress this all the time. We have to make sure that we, we able to reason, we're able to reasonably um, uh, complete their expectations for these, uh, these cases. So sometimes we can't. Sometimes we have to go with different designs or different options. We have to look at the jaw relationship. Make sure there's enough intraocclusal space to fill with these types of attachments and bar assemblies and, and things like that, denture teeth and acrylic. There's a lot of materials that are going into this and we have to make sure that we're able to fill that space in a functional and aesthetic way. And of course, the communication between the dentist and the, and the lab technician, the communication between all of us for case planning. Some of the common mistakes in constructing implant over dentures are poor treatment planning, distorted impressions, inaccurate master models. That's why we have on bar cases, we, you know, we, we, we wanna make sure we, get, we go through the right protocol. And we'll talk about that uh, a little, little while with verification indexes poor fitting frameworks, and the wrong choice of materials and attachments. A successful implant supported over denture is we want a stress-free fit of the attachment assembly, something that's gonna enable the patient to have good oral hygiene and biocompatibility of the chosen materials. So, and we want something with high biomechanical strength of the chosen materials. And I'll talk about this in a little while about the types of denture acrylics out there and what to use on these types of cases, because as the forces on this acrylic and all these components combined, we wanna make sure that we have something that's gonna have flexural strength and high impact resistance. And of course, it has to have natural looking aesthetics and the absence of interfering with normal, interference with normal phonetics. So with or without a bar, let's talk about that in, uh, now. So a bar can achieve evenly distributed forces between dental implants. And you know, the direct method with overdenture attachments incorporated into the denture base without a mill bar costs less and requires less vertical room. You know, so the final case design is determined what we have to work with intraorally. You know, 
Both methods require support from the tissue and the attachment. So keep that in mind, you know, and keep in mind that the denture rests on the soft tissue and the attachments act only as a retentive element preventing the denture from dislodging. So let's elaborate a little bit more of the advantages over, over denture. So you know, once we introduce attachments into the case design, we gain three additional advantages. You know, the over denture will become more stable than a complete denture, which leads to greater comfort and better aesthetics. Now we'll be able to determine how occlusal forces are handled and you'll have the, the choice of rigid and resilient attachments from which to choose. Therefore, you can decide if the overdenture will be supported by more by the abutments or if the ridge will handle more of the load and then we can achieve superior aesthetics. So uh, take all that into consideration, some good advantages and we're no longer relying on closed palate, or, you know, palate areas and heavily extended flanges, flanges to hold the denture in place on a lot of these types of dentures. You know, we must be sure that the flanges don't engage any in tissue undercuts uh, more than about one millimeter, and we'll and if that will shorten the flanges if that's that's uh, evident, so they don't create a different path of insertion than those indicated by the attachment. So you have to take all this into consideration, and it's best to be looking in each case by making a denture setup and making a putty matrix of the denture so it can guide you in placing the attachment. So really important. So let's get into this a little bit more. There's a lot of fixed and fixed removable solutions out there, but it's what the patient needs and what's going to be more functional for the patient and more aesthetic for the patient. So let's start with this photo here. On the left-hand side, we see without a denture. Then we see an implant hybrid denture, and it's still the patient's lip is sunken in with that hybrid denture. And that, uh, I, you know, I, I bet 100 to 1 that this patient, when this patient smiles, that transition zone with the hybrid denture, you're going to be see, able to see his natural tissue and it's not going to look that natural in the, in the mouth. But, so an overdenture with the flange is probably the solution. It looks the best with this type of denture from a side uh, sagittal view on here. Uh, so on the right-hand side, I would go with an overdenture with a flange. So let's talk about removable implant dentures, individual attachments versus bar attachments. So how do we choose? Well, let's consider an, with attachments only. An ideal ridge, is, a ridge structure is needed. So for instance, a lower full denture on a patient with an ideal ridge and good bone structure can easily have overdenture attachments placed into the final denture without the use of a bar. So we'll go right into the bone and uh, you know, it's, it's on, on an overdenture attachment on a lower, so we start right out with two, two attachments on a mandible. We wanna make sure when we're making these types of cases that a metal substructure is placed internally for strength. And we'll talk about some of the options for that in a little while. So uh, without that metal substructure to strengthen that denture, uh, most of the time you're gonna see breakage around where the attachments are. So an upper denture will be functional with just attachment if the patient's bite is in an ideal class one occlusion. And some of the deciding factors on the bar assembly, often the anterior flange of an upper has mobility. And if the patient is not ideal occlusion, this will happen. And you know, the, this causes a mesiodistal rock that can put all the stress on the attachments. And that's when we consider a mill bar assembly. If the patient has a flat ridge, there'll be no tissue support all of the pressure would be on the, on the attachments. And if possible, a fixed case is better. So a bar with a horizontal lock attachment, act, they act as sort of a fixed patient uh, removal prosthesis on these types of designs here. So uh, we'll take a look at the different bar designs and attachments uh, systems out there in a little while. But what about the overdenture protocol? Well, we want that preliminary impression of the healing caps. Then we're gonna take a custom tray final impression and if we're doing a bar on these types of cases, we definitely wanna make a verification jig. And I usually make that verification jig at the same time the bite rim is made. So uh, after everything's verified, then we go for the setup for try-in and then we'll try in our, uh, then we'll make our, uh, at that point too, we'll have our uh, internal strengthener in there with the try-in and then we'll do our insertion and attachment connection either in a laboratory or in the intraorally in the office here. So, and we'll get into that a little bit later, so. Let's talk, talk about some of the attachment choices on implant uh, overdentures. So I think the number one choice, and I, I wouldn't, I'm not able to cover everything tonight when it comes to attachments, but uh, I think the number one choice out there is locator. And I use locator a lot. I use a lot of the other attachment systems out there. We'll touch on that in a second. Uh, locator is a great attachment. It's, uh, you know, it's like I said, it's utilized a lot uh, for cast tube, for root attachments, for mill bars, of course, for implants directly into the, into the bone. Um, so, and it's, they even have um, uh, locator attachments for divergency issues or for when you have uh, implants that are not parallel, it's par parallel. So that's very important also, because not every case is perfect. As we know, we'd like to get these perfect cases where we don't all the time. So, 
And then you have ERA attachments still being used out there quite a bit. You know, I still we still get calls for ERA, ERA attachments, and um, you know, it's it's a it's a pretty popular attachment. And you know, this is again the final impression you can see on the uh, on the upper left hand corner here. And we pour a soft tissue model. And uh, once you pour that soft tissue model, we want to make a verification index because we're going to be making a bar. And then we do go through the protocol of a, a setup, you know, a occlusal rim, and a setup, and then we mill the bar. So. Um, and once that bar comes back, as you can see here, we made a metal framework on the upper left-hand side here. That's going to be our internal strengthener. And what I try to do on the denture triant for these overdentures is, is process those attachments. Uh, for instance, we're having attachments, these ERA attachments are going to be on top of the bar. So I want to attach those to the framework. And I'll use, either use a, a self-cure acrylic or I'll use a, a type of um, auto-mix acrylic to do that also. You know, so I'm going to have that denture set up with these uh, attachments incorporated into the setup. Do the wax try-in. If everything goes well, we can finish the case, as you can see it on the left-hand side. This particular design, I'm not crazy about. I probably would have put, put some more mesh around those areas where the uh, attachments are. Uh, but this wasn't what well, I didn't do this case, so uh, you know, I, I would I would have seen look at this and say, you know what, we need some more mesh around those areas where the attachments are. But uh, apparently, it worked out fine. This is the final denture. Beautiful denture, worked out really nice. I probably would have shortened those flanges a little bit too, but uh, patient was happy. You know, we, we, for him, this patient was really happy with this case. It was functional, it worked out well. There was no food entrapping. Um, occlusal scheme was great. So it was a really a successful case with um, a mill bar with the ERA attachments on top of the bar. So another type of attachment system to, to as an alternative, uh, if we have the equator system. You know, uh, the OT equator system is put up by Ryan 83. And I like this system. We utilize this a lot, especially when we have a minimal amount of room on cases. You know, when you start grinding denture teeth over a bar or an, or an attachment, you start uh, compromising the integrity of the shade and the strength of the tooth. So we'll get into that uh, as far as denture teeth, what kind of denture teeth you use in a little while. But uh, the OT equator is similar to the um, uh, locator attachments, the castable, they're for implants, for mill bars. They're compatible with all implant brands and cuff heights from one to seven millimeters with a standard two millimeter thread. So I'll show a picture of this attachment and uh, it's just a smaller profile when we, we do a comparison compared to the uh, locator. But sometimes that one millimeter two can really make a difference when you're, you're, you're grinding denture teeth or you need a little bit of room uh, to, in making these, these types of dentures. So this is a comparison. This is the OT equator and this is the locator. You can see it's a little smaller profile. The retentive element is, is great. It's pretty, pretty equal to the locator. I found out with the equator, I see not as much wear and tear on the locator as I do on the locator, on, on the equator as I do on a locator. But um, that could be because of the differences in, is in, um, in divergency too. When you have a divergent case where you have par not parallel implant, implants that are in parallel, it's going to wear down those, uh, those nylon uh, inserts a lot faster. So this is the LT equator. This is going to be uh, the processing, the clinicians processing these interorally. And you can see how nice this looks. It's a nice case and worked out really well. There are four implants on the mandible here. It's going to be steady, st sturdy, and, uh, and functional. There you go. There's the LT equator. And this is one of the overdenture. This is an overdenture bar case that I inherited from another laboratory. I was just having trouble with this case wasn't satisfying the dentist and patient's needs and he gave it to me and I, I evaluated it and we made a, a verification index on it. We decided to make a bar with the OT equator attachments on here. So uh, everything looked good. We did a denture try-in uh, on this. We had an internal, uh, we had, uh, uh, internal uh, support structure, mesh structure, and then we had a cast bar, uh, mill bar. And you can see the equator attachments on the mill bar, much like that, uh, that ERA case I showed earlier. You know, so uh, but we weren't able to go too far uh, back with the, uh, the bar in this case. And uh, and uh, so we had four attachments over the bar and worked out really well. This was the denture trying the wax trying when I did the uh, with the uh, metal substructure internally process the attachments. And this is this is the final case when you can see uh, internally how everything worked out nicely with the uh, the framework and the attachments. So a lot of choices out there, you know, and just recently I, was, I, I actually did a case. I didn't have time to get elaborated on it tonight with the. Um, uh, Strauman, who has the metadenica uh, types of attachments, were, were fantastic. And uh, my next presentation, my seminar, I'm going to elaborate more on the different systems and how to utilize them. Uh, tonight, we don't have that much time, but I wanted, just wanted to show a few of the, the ones that I've been successful with. And when you hear me talk in my, my presentations, I don't talk about just products. I talk about products that have made, and techniques and science, the science behind these products that have made me successful 
and the clinicians I worked for uh, worked work for successful all these years and gave the patient satisfaction and longevity on these types of cases. So, and you talk about framework strengtheners. Uh, there's a lot of choices out there. Most of the time I'm going with a, a cast mesh framework strengthener uh, and that works out really well. And this is a, a, a simple cast mesh work, uh, framework strengthener in this particular case. And then there's other options too now. We have different um, uh, polymer materials out there that are st really strong. You have your peak materials, pectin materials and stuff that's gonna be a little bit lighter and a little more aesthetic looking. Uh, and I've used these internally also on in these types of cases and worked out very well. So let's get back to the divergency issue. Now, look, let's look at this particular uh, case here. This is a, these are the Ryan 83 uh, attachments here. Uh, and uh, these are called a smart box. And this is about 30 degrees of uh, divergency. And they have rotational caps in them, which is great because it uh, compensates for that divergency issue. So uh, uh, these tend to work out really, really well. If we didn't utilize this type of attachment, we would have some problems with wearing and tearing and possibly not a good fit on these types of cases. So, and like I mentioned before, there are a couple other systems out there that do address the divergency issues on these types of cases, uh, including locator. And this one is called a smart box by Ryan 83. And that sense what really works out well on a lot of the cases that I've, did, I've done with the, uh, that had those, kind of, those types of issues. Let's look at the overdenture mill bars. There's so many different bar designs out there for overdenture mill bars. Pretty much we're doing a, a titanium mill bar with uh, an attachment assembly. Uh, they were able to drill into the bar and, and utilize, and it could be anything from ERA to locator to Rhine 83 to any other attachment system on the market. I just wanted to show a couple of different photos here with different mill bars with locator attachments and, and other attachment systems you can see. But these, you know, the technology has come so far with these types of cases here. Uh, and uh, really functional and, and, and it works, they worked out really well. We just wanna make sure we have enough room. Dolder bars, I don't do many dolder bars anymore. I used to years ago, uh, more of a rigid type assembly on the bar here, uh, but they, I still see them once in a while. Hater bars, we still get hater bars. Matter of fact, we just did a combination case with a hater bar uh, and hater clips on the anterior and Ryan 83 attachments on the posterior and that worked out really well and uh, really functional on the upper case that we did. So we touched a little bit on the uh, implant overdenture cases. We're gonna talk a little bit about uh, uh, what immediate load cases are all on four or all on six type of cases. So let's talk about the, uh, um, the, what's involved in, in planning these cases. So all on four, all on six, I'd like to see six implants on an upper instead of four in case one fails. Uh, so most of the time we are doing uh, six implants on an upper and maybe four, probably four on a lower. So on the implant placement on these types of cases, you know, we've been doing a tilted implant placement with four uh, or more, more implants. And the posterior most implants are tilted at 45 degrees or less. It's a graftless procedure and bone grafting is avoided by tilting the posterior implants, uh, utilizing the available bone. And we make, wanna make sure we have available bone. And immediate function for fixed provisional dentures or a bridge and for patients meeting the criteria, which is very important for immediate loading of implants. And we'll talk about the protocol and some of the uh, case studies on this in a little while. But uh, implant placement, the vertical implants with six or more implants, uh, sinus graft, grafting may be necessary, but vertical implant placement is done with those six or more implants instead of having those, that, angulate, that angulation we talked about with four implants before. So it's a proven long-term solution, has high survival rates. Uh, the all-in-four treatment concept is a proven long-term of up to 10 years of follow-up and more now, uh, and a mandible in five, I would say up to eight to 10 years in the maxilla now too. So uh, uh, very good results all the way around. Favorable, favorable bone and soft tissue parameters and stable marginal bone levels and healthy soft tissues, both the tilted and axial implants on these types of cases. It's just a, a radiographic image of an all-in-four case on an upper and lower. Uh, and we utilize a lot, of, many times with the multi-unit abutments on, the, on these types of cases. So the multi-unit abutment is carefully designed to rehabilitate both the edentulous and the partial edentulous arches. So, uh, and using, utilizing the uh, clinically proven all on four concept. And these, all, these, you know, these types of um, uh, attach, uh, multi-unit abutments are carefully designed. We have a short cone for limited occlusal space with different um, angles from 17 to 33, 30, 30 degree variations on the angulation on these. Uh, it could be tricky though. So we wanna make sure I always use um, some sort of um, 
key registry that I used when, I, when I'm using these, uh, doing these implants. So we know uh, some verification type of index on these type of uh, uh, abutments. So they're placed properly when the, page, when the dentist is trying these in the mouth and trying in these, these, uh, these overdenture cases. And what I try to put forth on these, on these types of uh, abutments are, uh, is a multi-unit aligning tool and which, uh, which um, Nola Biocare sells. And it's a really good tool and um, it helps you to correct a multi-unit uh, abutments for each case. And it simplifies the identification of the screw hole trajectory on these types of cases. So, uh, uh, and uh, it saves time with the faster multi-unit abutment selection. So, uh, you know, I've, I've been in situations in the, in the dental office where these multi-units were, multi were in place correctly and the clinician is going crazy that you're trying to, trying to place them correctly. So that's why I, I try to give them some sort of index, whether it be a Doralay index or a putty index so they can place these correctly. Uh, and I, I make that index while these multi-unit abutments are on the model in the laboratory. So it makes it a lot easier. So what's the dental laboratory's role in, in, in making these types of cases? So, you know, we're evaluating these cases, you know, uh, we, it might be an immediate case, but a denture type case where patient has existing teeth, patient might have an existing denture, and once more of a stabilized denture with a, 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 a screw retained type of denture. So case planning on, on, the, on the implants with a dental laboratory's role is to speak to the doctor and, and oral surgeon and plan these cases out correctly. We have to look at the denture type and the occlusion. And uh, we'll be there uh, for in-office support the day of surgery with the denture conversion. So uh, we'll talk about denture conversions in a little while too. So denture conversions can be very easy or they can be very difficult. If the, if the planning is correct, it's gonna be very easy and if you're using the correct materials. So, uh, and then we'll touch on digital technology too that helps us with these types of, um, uh, types of cases on the, uh, the day of the insertion when we do chair side conversions. So day of surgery, the dental technicians will come to the dental office and the technician will assist with the step-by-step -step procedure in converting a removable prosthesis to a screw retained denture. Like I mentioned before, it could be an existing denture that we're converting over, or it can be a new uh, immediate denture uh, that uh, uh, we're gonna be converting over. So, uh, and so what we're doing, say for instance, the patient had six implants and uh, they had implants placed, uh, many times, like uh, just recently, we had a patient that had, uh, had eight upper teeth re uh, removed and six implants placed in, in the upper in the morning and in the afternoon, we met the I met the doctor at the office and we went in the office and we did the conversion. So we had a, an immediate denture and we filled the provisional prosthesis of the denture with a, a heavy body material. And we put this prosthesis in the mouth and we got the uh, impression of where uh, the implants were. And so now I know exactly where to drill the holes for those temporary cylinders. So I drill those holes into the prosthesis uh, where the abutment locations are. And uh, I start with a small hole and I make them a little bit bigger. And I try to get a little larger than the diameter of those um, uh, temporary cylinders. And then I place the temporary cylinder, the doctor places temporary cylinders onto the low profile abutments and make sure that all of the cylinders are completely seated onto the abutment. And then we try in the uh, denture and we wanna make sure it's a passive fit and we want to relieve any acrylic resin around the cylinders where it's needed. So in this photo, I, I probably made it a little too large here, but we want to make sure that it's a little bit larger than the temporary cylinders. You know, so we want any contact on the restorative components. And <clears throat> what we'll do at this point is uh, I'll, I'll take a, a marker or a Sharpie and mark these temporary cylinders right near the occlusal surface or the lingual surface where they should be cut. And we'll take them out of the mouth and we'll cut them. Sometimes I have doctors uh, who just take a disc and cut them in, intraorally also. Uh, but a lot of times I like to have them uh, out of the oral uh, environment. I'll take them all into the hand piece and lay them and cut them down. And then we're ready after the cut down, we're ready to, to cure these uh, temporary cylinders into the denture. So I use an oral polymerization type of material. It's called Quick Up and I'll show it in the screen in a little while. And what I'll do with this material is just we'll, we'll paint the uh, primer around the areas where we want this material to stick. And we'll go around the temporary cylinders and we'll cure them. And it's usually about two, it takes about two minutes to cure. So, um, and don't be too brave with this because you know I've had uh, instances where the clinician said, oh, you know, we have six implants. I can probably do every, it's all six at once with, this, with the uh, material, with the syringe. And then we ran into problems where the patient wasn't, wasn't in the correct occlusion Things started setting up too quickly and then we had to do everything over again. So we had to ream everything out and do the, uh, put the uh, temporary cylinders back. So you, don't, you wanna make sure that you're doing this the correct way and maybe do two to three at a time and you, you feel safe doing that. So this is material I use, it's called Quick Up. And I love this material because 
you know, years ago, what did we have? We had culture acrylic and culture acrylic tends, tends to run all over the mouth. You know, it just runs where you don't want it to run. Quick up material, after you uh, put the primer on there, all you do is have this auto cure cartridge and you inject it around the, uh, the uh, temporary cylinders. And after two minutes, you take it out of the mouth. And whatever you missed on the tissue side, they have a light cure material quick, quick up also. So you can just compensate for those little voids by putting some of this light cure material and it works really well. And the light cure for maybe about 30 or 40 seconds. So, and that's it. And after that, we take the denture out. You know, we have the patient bite down into occlusion. After we put this material around the uh, temporary cylinders, make sure they're in occlusion. And then we take it out. I, I'll cut out the palate. I'll finish and polish it, and uh, we go from there. And then the patient's ready to uh, go home with a screw retained prosthesis, a temporary prosthesis for at least four to six months on an average. And here's some photos with the dentist uh, doing this intraorally with six impl five implants on the lower here. I think these uh, holes were a little too large, but uh, it worked out well, you know. And uh, and uh, we did the uh, lower here, and the upper had four implants. We cured that intra early, and this was a successful case here. And you can see the doctor was pretty happy. He's got a bottle of champagne ready to celebrate. So these could be very, very gratifying for the patient and, and all involved. You know, when you're spending this much time planning these types of cases, you know, it's it's very rewarding. If you do this correctly, it's very rewarding to see those patients uh, happy with a screw retained denture. And everything you work, all the protocol that you followed during the whole period of uh, planning these cases from start to finish, it's really rewarding to see as functional and aesthetic and the patient smiling again and walks out of that office the same day that these implants were placed. And uh, this particular patient I mentioned earlier, uh, you know, extractions and implants and one morning you think it was, it's going to be such a traumatic thing. And I think, I still think it's traumatic, but the patient was in such good spirits after we put this uh, upper uh, uh, hybrid denture uh, and we converted her uh, uh, denture into uh, um, uh, immediate denture into a screw retained denture. It worked out really well. You know, so uh, 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 those types of cases are very rewarding. So then we also have printed technology. We've, we've been working with this for a while now, with printed technology for hybrid transitionals. And, you know, I don't have time to go into surgical guides today, but we, you know, definitely recommend a surgical guide on all these types of cases. But now with printed technology, with surgical guides, we can actually print the, the provisional denture and, and have the, um, the uh, access holes already drilled out for us. So, and uh, everything's gonna be, uh, we designed this on the uh, three shape or exocad. And uh, so it'll be into, into the correct occlusion and we'll have all those uh, uh, access holes all drilled out. And it's all utilizing the uh, surgical guide. And so this technology has really been successful for us lately. And, and we're going to work towards that, I think, uh, in the future. You know, I don't see, I don't think personally, you're gonna see as many in office conversions by drilling holes and trying to access the, uh, drilling those access holes and, and uh, for the temporary cylinder. I think everything's gonna be done digitally. So we come a long way digitally. And uh, even on digital ventures, we come a long way. So that's a whole other seminar that I did. So uh, I look forward to those in the future. So let's talk a little bit about hybrid dentures. Let me look at my time here. Good, we're running, good timing is good here. Um, I go fast because we have a lot of, lot of uh, material to cover. So, uh, and we'll have time for questions hopefully at the end. So let's talk about hybrid dentures. Patient expectations, really important. You know, we wanna make sure we meet the patient expectations and we, if we can't, if they're not reasonable, then we have to come up with an alternative plan. So let's look at the relative capacity functional capacity of a lower jaw, <clears throat> excuse me. With all natural teeth, it's 100%. When you go down to a lower denture, look, it's a zero, it's only 10%. An implant over denture is 60%. So with uh, you know, an implant for a bridge, born bridge or a hybrid type case, it's 90% functional capacity. So I thought that was really interesting on this, on this chart here. You know, so, you know, you, you, it just makes you wonder what patients go through if they didn't have the right occlusal scheme or right uh, function on a, on a fully attentionless case with just a regular denture all, the, all these years. You know, so uh, the functional capacity was way down there. So some of the special considerations we have to look at here. So, uh, you know, we need adequate bone quantity, of course. You know, so bone height, uh, uh, about 12 millimeters or more to allow for at least 10 millimeters length on the implants. This includes residual bone and uh, after the tooth extractions also, and the bone width about six millimeters or more to allow for four millimeter diameter implants. So uh, limited grafting can be accomplished at the time uh, of the implant placement also. 
We want ad adequate restorative volume that provides space for an implant uh, components in the prosthesis from 12 to 15 millimeters. And I'll show a nice slide in a couple of, couple of minutes here that you can take a look at. I love this slide here because it gives you a breakdown of how much space you need for each component. And of course we need the adequate AP anterior posterior spread for optimal positioning of implants and to limit cantilevering. Uh, if you remember that overdenture case I showed earlier that I took, I took on from another laboratory, you know, we were limited as far as the, the, the amount, of, amount of length on that bar because of the AP spread, you know, so because we didn't want any of those, uh, those cantilevering on those implants and that stress to be put on uh, those posterior most implants because they would fail. And we want to have adequate uh, coverage of the lip to hide the transition zone on these types of cases. Sometimes we can't have that and we have to go back to an overdenture case. Some of the precautions we have to look at here is, uh, you know, bleeding disorders, uncontrolled metabolic diseases, diabetes, cardiovascular, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, compromised immune systems, and maybe parafunctional habits we have to look at. And we want, of course, the course is that if there's poor bone quantity, then we have we can't do these types of cases. Okay, we covered this earlier. You know, the best bone height and bone width. And the anterior spread, you know, edentulous patients expect posterior first, uh, first molar occlusion. You know, in treatment planning, uh, the position of the implants and following the protocol of AP uh, anterior post posterior spread can achieve this result. So what we do is we measure the distance in millimeters between the anterior implant and the most posterior implant. And then we take a measurement and multiply it by 1.5. And this, this 1.5 measurement it's uh, multiplication, it offers you the distance that teeth can be cantilevered on most implants. So uh, it's very important. So again, yeah, you know, we multiply, take the measurement and multiply it by 1.5. And the good news is that with planning software now on when you're planning these bars cases, it's incorporated into the software. So it actually tells you how far your AP spread should be, which is great. Uh, so we should uh, do a lot of this uh, um, multiplication by, by hand or just uh, anticipating by, by, by hand by, by, by uh, using this um, type of uh, measurement. And it works, it worked. But now it's so easy now with the digital technology where you know, all the answers are pre presented to us uh, on the screen, so, which is nice. So, so let's look at the restorative space. Restorative space on this case, sure, we have plenty out here. There's going to be a lot of restorative space in this type of case. Yeah, it's kind of an ugly case. This type of case here, we might not have enough room for a bar and attachments and things like that. You know, if there's an overdenture case, um, if it's a hybrid case, we're going to be in a little bit in trouble here. I don't think it's going to be enough room. So some bone reduction might have to be done on this type of case. This is that slide I was talking about before uh, with adequate restorative volume. Look at the different uh, components here. You know, we want at least 12 to 15 millimeters with these components here. And it's a breakdown of everything we need here from the apartment to the, uh, to the denture teeth here. So uh, really important, you know, I would love to have acrylic uh, space, but uh, move for acrylic for about four millimeters and teeth about four millimeters, but sometimes I don't get that. And so uh, that's why it's really important when we talk about denture teeth, when we're grinding denture teeth, you wanna make sure you have a, utilize a good strong denture teeth that's gonna bond well to the acrylic. And we wanna look at the transition zone. You know, sometimes we, we might not be able to utilize a, a hybrid type case. The patient might not be able to uh, cleanse it correctly. Uh, and we might have to go back to an overdenture take case where the case, patient can take it out of the mouth. We'll still hide that transition zone. We'll have lip support and the patient can, it'll be cleansable. And what about tissue contact? Well, as you can see the picture on the lower, this patient has some reaction with this uh, denture acrylic. Could have been an allergic reaction. Could have been too much tissue contact and too much pressure. Uh, with the screw retained denture. Uh, I try to limit that. I try to um, create at least one, one and a half millimeters of space between the tissue and the denture. This patient, this way the patient can be, you know, be have a, a cleansable type of appliance. And your average, average fees. I mean, it, it, you talk about uh, uh, profit on these types of cases. It's a pretty good profit. On an average case, uh, on, United States, uh, around the United States, these doctors uh, are charging uh, an average of $27,000 on a case, which is great. You know, so both the laboratory and the, uh, the defenses can make a, a nice profit on these types of cases, but they have to be done correctly with correct planning and the correct materials. So let's talk a little bit about um, uh, protocol now and um, on these types of cases. We talked a little bit earlier about the, the hybrid case, I mean, the um, overtenture cases. Um, First, we need that preliminary impression. Then we're going to get uh, our second impression, the final impression with a custom tray, either open tray or closed tray. And then we pour our soft tissue cast, master cast. And at that point, we're going to make our verification index and our base plate and fiber. And when 
I make the base plate and birim. I try to put at least one or two temporary cylinders into the birim so it, it's secure when you're taking the by registration. And then if everything comes back okay and the verification index is fine, we'll do that tooth setup. You can try in the tooth setup and everything looks good from there. Then we're gonna send it off to uh, where we get the bars mill. Could it be Panthera, could it be Nobel, uh, could be Biomed Simmer, what, you know, whatever is successful for you. And all of those companies I mentioned do a great job. <clears throat> Once we send this out, uh, a few days later, we'll get a verification JPEG to make sure everything looks correct and everything's in the right place. We'll look at the access holes, the amount of space between the denture teeth and the bar. And then that comes back to us and we transfer that denture, original denture setup over to the bar. We do one more try-in with the bar and the tooth setup in wax. And then after that, we process and finish. So uh, we wanna follow this protocol very closely and uh, for a successful case. So let's go through the protocol a little bit more here. So we're gonna fabricate our soft tissue metal from a master cast, for that is the second visit. This is our rigid verification index and then we make our birim and with those temporary cylinders in the birim also with the occlusal rim. And you know, when we're doing these occlusal rims, it's great if you can give us information on the, on the occlusal rim with the, uh, with the midline, cuspid line and high, bit, high lip line. Uh, we want to make sure we get the proper information because we're working with intraocclusal space here, uh, 40 millimeters or more sometimes, even with, when we're doing a full upper or full lower denture, even with hybrid type cases. And we needed information from you at the, um, you know, at the, at the, at the dental office. So it's important for us to get that. And it helps us um, place these teeth correctly when we're setting up these uh, denture teeth and to give you the occlusal scheme and right aesthetics and function that you need. This is a material I utilize for uh, the verification indexes. It's great, it's called Prima Splint. There's no shrinkage or expansion on this material. It sets up in about three minutes in the light cured uh, unit. And I use this a lot. I just wrap it around the temporary cylinders or the cylinders and, uh, and put it in the light cured unit and then voila, I have, I have a verification index. If I'm doing a full arch, cross arch type of case, I will then split the verification index and uh, I'll cut it in a couple of different places. And what the doctor usually does at this point, he'll put that, screw those sections in the mouth, loop it together with some Duralay with some more, more light cured material, and then take another impression to make sure everything lines up correctly. So uh, to me, that's more accurate. I've done full arch verification indexes, but many times it's, they have to be cut. Uh, so uh, especially when you have divergency issues. So if everything looks good, it comes back to the laboratory. We're gonna be uh, doing our denture setup and for our try-in and then we're ready to, uh, and we're going to elaborate more on these setting the denture teeth now. So um, with articulators, let's go back to articulators a little bit now. Uh, you know, I like to utilize a fully adjustable or semi-adjustable articulator when we're doing these types of cases. And if I can get a face ball transfer, that's even better for me. I love face ball transfers. To me, it's like having the, the patient at the bench with me and uh, it just makes things a lot easier. And then I'm getting a true uh, hinge access relationship of the patient uh, on that articulator. And uh, we have such successful um, setups and tooth setups and occlusal schemes and, and try-ins with these, those types of that type of information from uh, um, you know, Facebook transfer. So let's talk about setting denture teeth. How do we select anterior teeth? Well, we look at the face. Usually facial features uh, equal the, feet, the, the shape of the tooth. So we look at facial features and um, let's go cross-section this face here. So if we usually have a square face, we'll have a square anterior tooth or a central. Square tapering, square central. So let's look, we're gonna break out, break up the parts of the face here. We're gonna put the midline, we have a cuspid line. And then, you know, as this is broken up, this is the information we wanna get on a bike occlusal rim also. The high lip line, the smile line, cuspid lines, and this is gonna help us to set denture teeth correctly. So we have to determine the mold and we can determine the mold, like I said, by the shape of the face uh, or a study model. I've been, when, the way I pick out anterior teeth, uh, I look at the shape of the arch. If I look at an upper arch, if you look at an upper arch or an upper model, it looks like a central. So it could be a square arch, square tapering arch, and that I utilize and I correspond that with the shape of the denture teeth. So, or else I can take the, um, the bite registration, the occlusal rim, I'll measure from cuspid to cuspid on the bite block, and I'll go to the tooth chart, and I'll give me some guidance of how to pick out those denture teeth. <coughs> Excuse me. So look at this uh, shape of this upper arch. It looks like a square central, square tapering central here. From the gingiva to the, uh, with the incisal edge. So this is how I pick out my anterior teeth all these years. And this is over 40 years of picking up denture teeth and it's been very successful, a successful method for me. But we have to consider the width of the six anteriors, the shape, the shape of the centrals, and of course the shade. 
And I, I, I spoke earlier about uh, facial form equals tooth form. And it's true. This is what we've been ap ap applying all these years. Facial form equals tooth form. The square tapering to square ovoid, it's usually the shape of the central, the shape of the face. Then we have our sagittal and frontal, frontal considerations. You know, the tips of the canines are usually equal to the width of the nose and the widths of the centrals are, are equal to the width of the filter. So we have all these anatomical landmarks which we can follow. We want something that's harmonious and aesthetic when we're setting up these denture teeth. And we wanna use a denture tooth that's gonna be functional and something that's gonna wear like natural dentition. So before I get into setting the interiors, uh, I wanna look talk about using the correct denture teeth. So we want something that's gonna be homogenous throughout the whole entire tooth. So especially with implant cases. And if you haven't heard this, you probably heard this before, but implant cases, the denture teeth wear faster than your average full upper, full lower denture. Uh, and um, so we were looking at something with high mechanical strength, something that's gonna be plaque resistant, tissue friendly, something that's gonna have chip free grinding. And when I put that in there, I mean a lot of denture teeth out there that are out on the market. When you start grinding that first layer of the denture tooth, you get to a softer layer and that's gonna wear faster. So you want a tooth like a Vita tooth that's gonna have ceramic fillers, a Hraes, Colzer, Mondial teeth, um, even um, Ibuclar teeth are great. Uh, it's just a lot of great teeth out there, you know, and uh, um, it's, it's, it's a lot of good choices. So you wanna make sure you use a quality tooth that's gonna wear almost like natural dentition. <clears throat> we want something the same size as natural teeth, something with high wear resistance. And I like lingual anatomy on the anteriors because it's, it aids to better phonetics, you know. Uh, a lot of new, especially with new bed denture patients, a lot of new denture patients, when they, their tongue tends to slide off the lingual of the teeth and they sort of lisp. Well, lingual anatomy on the uh, anterior region of the teeth uh, really helps in aiding for better phonetics. So I'll show you this particular case that I did. You see these Avita teeth here and they have lingual anatomy and it feels natural to the patient. And, and this, this is a full denture, but I put the natural rugae in there. So the patient really felt like it was a natural feel in the patient's mouth and the phonetics were great and the function was great on this particular denture. Want something that's gonna aid in chewing and swallowing and something with a wider occlusal surface because we don't want a denture tooth that's narrow. We want something that's gonna mimic natural tooth morphology, you know, so the patient can function and chew and tear their food correctly. And something that's gonna be fully aesthetic and with a nice emergence profile. So when we're setting up these denture teeth on these types of cases, we want something that's going to be, the anterior is going to be positioned individually and parallel to the pupil line. And those lower incisal edges are going to be parallel to the upper incisal edges. So um, there's some certain tools we can utilize for this, the setting up denture teeth. You know, we look up here on the picture on the top, we have minimum ridge resorption. So I'm going to set denture anterior teeth on this particular case. I'm going to come about six to eight millimeters from the papilla and set those denture teeth. This is going to give me lip support. It's going to look aesthetic and it's gonna be functional. Uh, with the lower photo here with the maximum ridge resorption, you know, if we see, if you start setting denture teeth against that ridge, that patient's gonna be sunken in and it's not gonna look natural. And as I go, I go around the country teaching uh, denture setups, I see a lot of dental technicians doing this and setting these denture teeth against the ridge. And you really have to look at all the anatomical landmarks and ridge resorption and all the factors that come into play when you're setting denture teeth. So I utilize something called an omic gauge and I put it in, it's a, it's a little instrument. Densply has it, there's a couple other companies that have this out there and, and uh, it sells, Ivoclar sells it. Um, and there's a pin that goes into the inside, uh, to papilla, inside the papilla, and you come about eight to 10 millimeters out from the papilla to set your denture teeth. So we're gonna place our centrals at the correct inclination. We place all laterals at the correct inclination, about eight to 10 millimeters. Then I'll um, utilize an occlusal plate to verify the incisal edge. And this is if I didn't have the guidelines of an, uh, an occlusal rim to go by. You know, So hopefully I'll have the guidelines of an occlusal rim to go by. So what I'm doing now, I'm setting the anterior teeth. I'm gonna have the centrals and the cuspids touch that occlusal plate. And those, and the lateral is gonna be off the plate about one millimeter, as you can see here. Centrals and canines, cusp touching the plate, lateral off the, off the plate by one millimeter. And then I'm gonna set my lower centrals and anterior teeth, allowing one millimeter of vertical and horizontal overlap and keeping in mind inclination. I'm gonna follow the guidelines in the upper. So my anterior teeth are set, I can twist and turn them to more softer arrangement to maybe a little bolder arrangement for the male. Um, but now we have to look at the type of occlusal scheme. So with these implant cases I'm talking about, I like to use a lingualized occlusion scheme where we have that lingual cusp of the upper going into the central fossa of the lower. And that's gonna relieve any off axis stress on the implant and on the ridge. 
So I even utilize this type of occlusal scheme for full cases, which is great. So the, I like to use an anatomical tooth uh, and semi-anatomical semi tooth when I'm setting my denture teeth. Uh, but now with the uh, denture teeth that are out there, especially with lingualized occlusion, those teeth are already prefabricated for us with nice tooth morphology, a 15 degree cuspal inclination on these types of teeth on, on, on the uh, lingualized occlusal teeth. And so it's gonna be something that the patient can chew and tear their food correctly and have a nice functional denture. As you can see, some of the different occlusal schemes out there from monoplane, which I don't like, really like to use monoplane. The only time I use a monoplane teeth, possibly or maybe a five degree tooth if I have a severe class three uh, occlusion. So typically the smaller the ridge, the less degree of the tooth and the greater the ridge, the greater the degree of the tooth. So we wanna align the occlusal surfaces towards the center of the cranium, which is a curve at Wilson. The only time I'm not doing that is when I'm uh, trying to achieve lingualized occlusion. And I don't have my curve of Wilson with lingualized occlusion. So I wanna set these pretty much straight from the, uh, from the cuspid to the, uh, uh, to the second molar or first molar. And uh, I'm gonna have my curve of speed, but I'm not gonna have a curve of Wilson because I want those forces to come right down into the central fossa of those, tooth, those teeth. And if I have a curve of Wilson, that's not gonna happen. Again, we mentioned earlier the center of the posterior is the center of the cranium. That's a curve of, curve of Wilson. So let's go through some of our notes here. We wanna make sure the central cost of the teeth are on a, on a lower ridge. We don't, wanna, we, wanna, we don't wanna deviate from that or you're gonna have an unstable denture. Check the vertical inclination of the posterior teeth. Check your curve of speed and your curve of Wilson. Again, a little review. From buckle to lingual, your curve of Wilson and from anterior to posterior, your nice natural curve of speed. So. We want a harmonious transition to the posteriors when to set these teeth and look aesthetic and functional. And there's your final setup here. So I, I try to do a nice functional setup with a nice aesthetic wax up also. Touch, I'm gonna to touch a little bit more on lingualized occlusion here. So we see that some of these different occlusal schemes. Years ago, we had to use a higher degree of tooth on the upper and a lower degree of tooth on the lower to achieve occlus, uh, lingualized occlusion. But now we have specific teeth for that. And these are the Vita teeth that I, I just showed a uh, lingual form. And you know it's for the implant supported upper dentures and it reduces uh, and implant dentures then reduces the lateral side to side forces on the implant. Lateral forces could cause the implant to, implant to fail. And you see the buckle uh, part of the cusp of the tooth is a little shorter, and we flare those out a little bit more too. So it actually actually pushes away the cheek, so it eliminates cheek biting also. So uh, and then we set up these to wax up these teeth, the wax up these fryings to make it look more natural. And I like to show this photo here because I show, you know, which one do you prefer, the one on the left and the one on the right. And I can get a little fanatical when I, when I wax my dentures because I want it to look natural. <clears throat> Sometimes I'll even get a photo from a, from a clinician to match the existing gingiva on, on the patient, on, even on a wax up. And then I'll transfer that over to the uh, final finish when I do my, uh, my gingival staining, my denture base staining. Oh, we almost finished, let me go. I'm gonna uh, move through this real quickly here. So you see the triangles here. And then after everything comes back, we're ready to mill the case. We make a putty index of the denture setup. And we do a final, uh, we, we uh, send everything, the putty index <clears throat> with the denture setup to the uh, milling lab. And this particular photo was from uh, Noble Procera. We sent it to them, they sent us a 3D image. Make sure we have all the access holes correct. We can analyze that. We look, everything looks good. We go ahead and we do we have the bar mill. There's so many different types of bars out there. I like the hybrid bar design on these types of cases. And then we're going to transfer our wax triangle to the, the implant bar. And uh, what I do is make, I make a putty ma matrix. I close down the articulator. The teeth stay in the uh, matrix. And I wax up, up, I wax to do the final wax up onto the bar and we send it in for the final triangle. And there's your final wax up on the bar. So it's really, really important. And then when we, when we really to process the cases, we wanna utilize an acrylic that's gonna give us high impact resistance, uh, something that's gonna have flexural strength and uh, be a strong acrylic. And I'm gonna go through this real quickly here. And we wanna, we can either, we can mask the bar, use an opaque on the bar to make sure that color, that, uh, that bright uh, silver uh, color of the bar doesn't come through the denture. And I use something called VMLC, it's a light cured material. I wish I had more time to go through this. We're running out of time here. So I want to get to the end of the uh, uh, presentation. So as far as the acrylic goes, we have, you know, I like to use a denture base that's going to be, have a natural look, a low shrinkage factor, 
great bonds and denture teeth, good impact resistance and flexural strength. And I utilize something called Diamond D. It's a great acrylic from Keystone Industries. And it gives me all these factors that I'm looking for. So make sure you know, that you ask for a good acrylic that processing, because you can go through all these stages here and use an inferior acrylic and everything's gonna break off the bar. So the combination of the, the correct uh, opaquing of the bar and the right acrylic is gonna lead to a successful case. I don't think I have a breakage off a bar in over six years now with this type, these type of methods that I use. So, and then you can stain the denture like you see here. There's a whole different met method of doing this stain here, uh, removing the acrylic, some of the acrylic, applying these light cured stains and you get a nice aesthetic effect. Look at that, beautiful. So, and there's the denture in the mouth. I never took a picture of the gingerbread on here so we don't know how it looks, but it looks like a natural looking denture here. So, um, so I wanna finish up the presentation here. I know it's a lot of information I put in here. I always put a lot in there. This is an article I wrote a couple of years ago and this is a, a, an overdenture. I consider this an overdenture case. And this patient is 18 years old and went through his life with a, uh, high school years with a couple of orthodontic bands with a wire and a couple of denture teeth on him. So, I was called into the dental office and uh, to look at this case. And what we did, we had to evaluate what to do on this case. So what we, we decided to do, the patient can get implants. We did post and cores on the anterior teeth. So we wanted something, I, I, so my, in my mind, I said to myself, let's do a post and core and put an equator attachment on there and we can do an overdenture on top of that. So what I did, we waxed up these uh, copings. I put in the attachments, the equator attachments, we, we boiled it out. Uh, we burnt it out rather. We cast these, uh, these post and cores. Doctor cemented them in. We had a final impression, as you can see here. Poured up the model. And look at the malocclusion on this case here. So now I bring it back to the laboratory. I said, wow, we got to figure out some sort of design on this case here. So I didn't want to do a metal partial on there. So I used this material called acetyl resin. And I set the denture teeth. I put a putty matrix on here. And I injected it in a framework. And I took the denture teeth out of the mold and injected it with uh, acetyl resin, as you can see here. So it was almost like a snap-on smile type of case with attachments. And what I did at this point here, I put it on the model here. We set our denture teeth back on the model. We processed the case. You can see it, it compensated for the malocclusion here. And I have put some denture-based stain on the uh, duracetyl material to make it look more natural. So on the, the six anterior teeth, they're natural teeth uh, on here. I think that was an Ivoclar teeth. And then we have on the posterior, we have the actual uh, acetyl resin material. So then I processed the attachments. These are the three equator attachments intraorally. And I wanted something that was gonna keep these, uh, you know, as far as seal this in the patient's mouth without getting food trapped in there. So I placed a material called Versacryl, which is a, a soft, soft liner material, which softens up the warmth of the mouth and it created a seal. So I got a call, I was at a dental show. I got a call on a Saturday uh, from Dr. Merrill. He said, Dennis, because you wanna come in the office on Monday, to treat this, to see how this, this case goes. We're gonna, we're gonna do the final insertion. And it was fantastic. I went in the office and the patient's mother was there and, and the patient was in the chair. And keep in mind, we did all this uh, pro bono. We didn't charge a penny for this. This patient went through hell, the, his whole high school year in his life, went through a lot of operations, really felt bad for the patient. He needed to have some sort of change in life here, some quality of life, especially with a smile. So I was called up in the office and this is before and after with Josh. You know, this is Josh before the surgery, I mean, with the, the, uh, the overdenture, and this is him after. And he was so emotional. His mother was so emotional, and he was so, it was such a successful case. No adjustments at all. We had this thing snapped into place. He's still functioning to this day. And, uh, and I remember him calling him over. He said, Mr. Urban, he goes, you think the girls are going to look at me now? I said, sure. Look how handsome you look with that denture. You know, so this is one of my most successful cases. And if you want to read the article, it's IDT Magazine, the Aegis Communication, and it was written out in two, it was in May and June, I think it was about four years ago, but you can just put uh, uh, Overdenture Protocol and it'll come up, the article will come up. But I think we, uh, and we might be able to send that to you also. We might be able to send that in a PDF form. So with that, artistry through denture technology, I want, I'm sorry I went over a little bit tonight. We have so much information, but I truly believe artistry through denture technology and the communication between the dentist and the uh, dental technician to achieve patient acceptance is, is definitely feasible. So thank you everybody for today for joining us. And if you want any more information, you can contact me at dherbandentalservices.net or contact our Implant Experience Center at 888-354-3594. And I'm going to turn it over to Jessica. I don't know if we have time for questions, Jessica, but I'm going to turn it back to you.